The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Sonic Web Studios specializes in custom web design, app development, social networking, search engine optimization, domain registration, email marketing, online stores, and more. Since our birth, we have been designing and developing immaculate websites and providing web solutions which are a cut above the rest. As a leading web designing enterprise, we have a team of extremely talented web designers who are well focused and have the experience of working on multiple web developing platforms such as PHP, Magento, Custom WordPress and more. Sonic Web Studios has been helping businesses of all kinds whether big, small, established or startup impress their audiences with exemplary web solutions. We don't just create beautiful and functional websites, we give you a complete online solution with the main goal of enhancing your yearly revenues. We aim to give your business the online exposure and brand acknowledgement that will help you in achieving increased conversions leading to profitable sales. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show. It's time to give a shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international award-winning author, Mian Mosin Zia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, then you'll love Missing by Mian Mosin Zia. Available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries with two strangers and one target where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available Available in paperback and ebook on Amazon. Missing by Mia Mosin Zia has garnered great reviews and is even loved by Hollywood celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forbes Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today. Order Missing by Mia Mosin Zia. Now available at Amazon. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and themikewagnershow.com. Mike brings you great guests and interesting people from all across the globe. So sit back, relax, and enjoy another great episode of the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable, custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, check out the latest novel by well-known or winning author Mia Motion Zia of No Time for Love called Missing, an extraordinary relationship between two ordinary people based on real-life events that go through four countries, two strangers, and one target where truth is an illusion and the ones you love will be the first to go missing. Check out the book on Amazon and other retailers available on all formats today. Also, The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 30 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Apple, Amazon, Audible, along with Radio Public coming soon to Podbean, Buzzsprout, Pandora, and TuneIn. Also heard worldwide on Himalaya, Radio Public, Geo7, and more. Take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel and follow the Mike Wagner Show on Instagram and Twitter today. We're here with a terrific director who's... Um, from Milwaukee and uh, now living in Los Angeles. She's put out some uh, terrific films, The Scarapist, Field Day, and also the uh, critically acclaimed Breath of God. And um, she she basically has been um, taking filmmaking uh, back in the day to the 40s, which is film noir. And, and of course, uh, one, one of the movies we'll be talking about um, was previously in the uh, L.A. International Film Fest and um, ready to go on live very soon as well, too. And this is also tied to the Block Dahlia murder case. And this will go back to the days of the 40s. And so I guess get your Frank Sinatra on live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios in beautiful downtown Los Angeles, the director of Night Rain, Jean Marie Spicuza. Jean, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. And it's great to have you as well, too. So you've got a, you had some films out there making a mark called The Scarapist, 
field day, breath of God. And um, the current movie that you had out, Night Rain, at the L.A. Film Fest, and it's going to be um, out streaming very soon, too. It's about a group of indie filmmakers um, unknowingly hired by their stalker to make a low-budget film about um, Elizabeth Short, who's a black daily. We'll um, talk a little bit about that and um, just do a little throwback of the uh, 40s filmmaking. And before we get into all that, tell us how I first got started. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, tell us how you first got started. Oh, thank you. I At first I thought you said something about the podcast starting, and I thought... No, 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 no. How did you get started? How did I get started? How did we all get started? <laughs> well, what th- this is com- this is communication in nineteen forties. If we did this in nineteen forties, you know, people look at us as like, you know, there's podcasting in the forties. What is podcasting? Is is that from outer space or something? You know, that's what's so fascinating. So many people, William Conrad, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and so many others actually came up out of radio. Radio was a really big deal in the thirties and forties. And I still love it. I think it's fantastic. And it gives us an opportunity to use our imaginations. Wow, cool. So the way I got started, segueing from there. (laughs) Yes, it's the war of the worlds. It's coming soon. (laughs) But first, we have to get this out of the way before war begins. (laughs) Well, I was just going to say, and you know, one of the first great directors of radio, Orson Welles, who does get mentioned in Night Rain. Uh, More on that. But uh, I got started because I grew up with artists in my family, in particular my great uncle, Francesco Spicuzza, who made his living as a post-impressionist painter. I saw his paintings on the wall everywhere I went growing up and said, not I'm going to do that, but I do that. Like it was already in me. I was like two years old saying, I do that. So that was really the beginnings of my realization of my life as an artist. And everything I've done since then has really been about creativity. And film was a natural progression because film incorporates all of the arts. Mm -hmm. It incorporates uh, visual, dance, music, poetry, writing, you name it, acting, everything. And um, I think it was Irving Thalberg of MGM, one of the great artistic producers who was most famous for Grand Hotel, Um, in the 1930s, and he said art, uh, that art, uh, film would definitely be elevated to the level of art uh, because it communicates to so many people. And I think that was one of the things that really inspired me about film was the idea that you could reach so many people in one art form. I love it. Mm -hmm. And and it does sound amazing, too, and uh, we'll talk more about the uh, film noir and all the originality and whatever else here on the Mike Wagner show. And what was that one precise moment that influenced you into what you're doing today? So in other words, what was the one precise moment that says, aha, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It was when I was a student of philosophy at the university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, I was at a very good friend's house and he put on the movie, uh, Il Nome Della Rosa in the name, the name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, the novel that was adapted for the screen. And I said, oh, my God, you can do this with philosophy. I already knew about Hildegard von Bingen and knew I wanted to bring her to the masses. And that was that was the uh, Eureka, the rapture, the meta moment of this is it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting you brought up about uh, movies involving philosophy. So, what are some of the movies that you've seen that involve philosophy? I mean, this is just very interesting. It's like I have to literally think about this one when it comes to philosophy. Oh, yeah. And what it turns out, I mean, in addition to the name of the rose, which is a more direct way of thinking about the way philosophy can be brought into film, but if you think about so many films, films by Zeffirelli, like Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, The Life of St. Francis. Uh, if you look at movies, um, even movies like uh, Anchorus, uh, independent film uh, that came out under the uh, Miramax Films distribution uh, in the uh, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, not only period films, though. Films noir, if you really pay attention to films noir, 
you will notice the psychology and the philosophy just permeates those films. And by the way, Films Noir, that was really the one major organic film movement to come out of the Hollywood system. So if you think about it, philosophy just permeates. And I think it was Orson Welles who said, you know, if you want to make great films, you need a poet behind the camera. And mm. we think about all of the poets who are, you know, philosophers. Pablo Neruda, Stephanie Strickland, Simone Weil. I mean, the list goes on and on. So it's, it's embedded in the art form. It really is embedded in the art form. That is amazing. And I was going to say spaghetti westerns. I guess we'll have to talk about it another time. So that's on the other side. And um, I was thinking about the movies that you're um, you know, going over involving philosophy. And uh, what are some of the more um, mainstream that comes to mind as well that involves philosophy? You talk about the independence, but uh, what about the more mainstream ones that you that you mentioned? The Matrix. The Matrix. Matrix. Oh my gosh! How, how 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 can I forget that? The Matrix. That's one of my favorites. I love the first one, except the part where you do slow motion trying to get away from the bullet that is now overused. I mean, that was serious cut. That was cutting edge. I'm mean, dead serious. Yep, it was philosophy in an action film. Hardcore, right there, bam, in your face. Wow. I did not think of that. I am so serious. And what are some of your other favorite um, movies uh, growing up? Oh, uh, Wait Until Dark with Audrey Hepburn had a big impact on me. That was really probably the first drama thriller I ever saw as a young person. Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock, big impact on me, huge. Again, you know, you have this intermixture of it's not a film noir, it's a suspense, but it's got film noir elements and, of course, it's also got a lot of psychological elements, really compelling stuff. That had a big influence. I mean, honestly, Star Wars and E.T. and the Muppet movie. Uh, <laughs> these <laughs> movies really did have a huge impact on me as a young person. A lot of the early creature features like Dracula and Frankenstein, there was always this underlying sense that these, these, these creatures who were somehow separated from society there was always this deeper underlying issue that they felt isolated and ostracized. And I guess I was always one for the underdog. Mm -hmm. you know? So I felt a real sympathy, for example, for, for Frankenstein's monster, you know, and it's just, it's just, there's so many layers to these films when you watch them again and again, you know, you go back and you think, wow, when I saw this as a kid, it had a certain, you know, translation, but, you know, Planet of the Apes is another example of like, wow, what an impactful movie. I mean, that had political elements, too, you know, in addition to like sci-fi. How fascinating. That had a big impact on me. You mm -hmm. know? And as I got older and into my middle years, it was like stuff like mazes and monsters and like a lot of the Tom Hanks films, you know, he was like he could do drama, he could do comedy. Robin Williams, too. Good morning, Vietnam. You know, that stuff. It really was interesting to see this interplay of drama and humor, you mm -hmm. know. And then the older I got, the more I just appreciated some of the older films, too, like especially the films noir. Oh, I just love films noir. They are so fascinating. You, you were talking about uh, some of the films as well, too. You see, like, several times you get a, a, a different interpretation each time. I think of the Truman Show, too, that um, you know, starring Jim Carrey. It's like, you know, when I first saw it, I thought it was just, you know, you know, simply God watching over this, um, you know, human going from birth to uh, being adult. And, an, and another time, it's almost like, um, you know, current reality TV, like Survivor. And watching again, it's just like, you know, Big Brother's watching you. <laughs> and, and then another time, it's like, this is what a TV production looks like. And, yeah, and of course, you know, fourth time, it's like, what is romance really like? You know, I had all these different interpretations every time I watch it. And I'm going to challenge myself again to watch the Truman Show. It's like, what interpretation could I get this time? It's funny you mentioned that because I recently watched that again, The Truman Show, and I was like, this is cool. I love, I don't want to, no spoilers for anybody. <laughs> of course no spoilers. <laughs> I, I love the part where, where he, he, he breaks through, as you, you know what I'm talking about, and he breaks through, and in that moment he also breaks free. You know, and he choo he, he's, he's a person who wants to choose freedom. 
you know, it's just it's just beautiful. It's really a wonderful, uplifting message for the human spirit. Truly, mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. And of course, I think about those products as well too. It's like you know, I I get to um you know have this coffee, but deep inside, it's like I hate this crap. <laughs> so. <you know. laughs> Right, with a smile. <laughs> and, and, of course, you know, playing like a TV wife when he's supposed to have like a real wife or real girlfriend. So it's like, how do I pull this off? So <laughs> it's really so, good. It's really clever. I feel like it incorporated a lot of the 1950s television. And I think it was it was Janine, was it Janine Bernstein who said that one of the great critics, she said, you know, I don't know where people, I guess the movies and television gave people the idea that the 50s were all about, you know, sock hops. Um, because the truth is, you know, you see movies like Blackboard Jungle. Blackboard Jungle is an excellent example of the, there was a lot of strife in the 1950s. We didn't always see that in television, but it was there. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, you know, projecting as well, too, like with the Elvis movies and also the um, the Beach Party movies and everything else. You're right. We encourage everybody to watch Blackboard Jungle to, to really see what the 50s was about. And um also, we'll talk about uh, some of your other films you've done, too, like The Scarapist, Field Day, and um, Breath of God before we get to the Night Rain. But first, listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable, custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, check out the latest novel by well-known award-winning author Mia Motion Zia of No Time for Love called Missing, an extraordinary relationship between two ordinary people based on real-life events that go through four countries, two strangers, and one target, where truth is an illusion and the ones you love will be the first to go missing. Check out the book on Amazon and other retailers available on all formats today. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 30 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on iTunes, Google Play, Apple, Amazon, Audible as well, too. Coming soon to Podbean, Buzzsprout, Pandora, and TuneIn. Also, check out the themikewagnershow.com. Take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. And follow the Mike Wagner Show on Instagram and Twitter today. We're here with director Jean Marie Spicuza here on the Mike Wagner Show. We talked a little bit about the, um, the filmmaking uh, of the 40s, a little bit of film noir, and some history behind it. And uh, before we get to uh, Night Rain, which is going to be um, streaming very soon after having a nice premiere at the uh, L.A. Fem International Film Fest. Um, yeah, I think one of your, um, your first projects, which you got a lot of um, good recognition and a lot of uh, kudos, was Breath of God. You can uh, tell us about that one. Oh, yeah. Breath of God was actually the very first screenplay I wrote. It was, a, uh, it was in the top 7% of the Nickel Fellowships, uh, which is the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences uh, Fellowship Award. It was... Uh, it, it actually still is a, an audio segment from the screenplay is on permanent exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. It is the only audio segment of a screenplay to date that's on permanent museum exhibition and archive. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And um, actually, Breath of God uh, is a bit of a, it's my magnum opus. It's what brought me to Hollywood, but I haven't made it yet. Um, it's still in the development stages. Uh, so that one is uh, is being uh, is is being worked on, uh, but it hasn't been made into motion picture just yet. And thank goodness, originally I wanted that to be like this is going to be my first movie, and uh, I le- I've learned a lot about movie making and how much I didn't know about movie making. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's really helped me a lot. It's helped me to gain the perspective that, oh, shoo, you know, I'm glad because I, I have so much still yet to learn um, and I'm learning. And so, yeah, I, I, I anticipate Breath of God within the next few years, but not quite yet. Not quite yet. And, and how long did you start Breath of God? Well, oh, that's an excellent question. I first learned of Hildegard in 1990. In March of 1990, I was working as uh, in, part-time in a classical music a department of a record store in, in downtown Milwaukee called the Radio Doctors. Oh, the wow. Man- yeah. The manager hands me a compact disc and says, this might interest you, a woman composer from the 12th century. I said, why haven't I heard of her? She said, he said, you of all people should know that. <laughs> 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 they got, they got off here of these remarkable women. Well, I was listening to this CD, and I was literally feeling like I had to hold on 
to something to keep myself from floating up. I mean, it was it is so potent and so powerful. It was spiritual songs by a group called Sequentia. Uh, performing Hildegard's music, which they say is still some of the most difficult to replicate because she wasn't formally trained. That wasn't happening for women in the 12th century. But what she did do was she wrote and she composed and she wrote, she created books of theology and science in a time when this was very unusual. She created two monasteries for women. And she, without the formal education, uh, her work is very, uh, you'd say, intuitive. It's very intuitive and really, really beautiful and transporting. So I was so blown away. And when I read the liner notes about her and how she's a, she was a philosopher, an herbalist, a playwright, a social critic, I said, oh, like me. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was like a validation. And I said, I can be all those things. I always felt like I was being pressured to be one thing in our post-industrial society, you know, that says you have to specialize, you have to specialize. And yet, it's very contrary to, I think, what the arts really are and what creativity is. So she really was the one who gave me permission, I think, to be myself, knowing that she existed. And from there, it was just a matter of time. I spent about seven years researching her and then three years writing the screenplay. I went to Biggin. I traveled there. I walked where she walked to feel the facts, as it were. And so it was ultimately about a good... Overlap, overlapping the time, it was probably a good eight to ten years of composing that work. Wow, that is yeah. a, that is amazing. And of course, you know, ten to twenty years can be a long time, or starting in nineteen ninety can be thirty years. But of course, according to God, it's like it's just comes and goes really quick. So, it, so, it, so it feels like yesterday sometimes. Honestly, Mark, I think that's a really good way of putting it. time is not necessarily what we think in in Augustinian time. The moment is now. The past is gone. The future is not yet. But who knows how to really measure it? Because like light and the way color is created by the eye, time is very much ordered through the mind. So five years can seem like a moment. Five minutes can seem like an eternity. It really is rather subjective, isn't it? It is very subjective. You talk about um, you know, all these calendars and everything, and it makes me think of the Mayan calendar, except you know they would have been much more advanced, except they kept eating too many Twinkies, and I think it stopped them December 26 <laughs> at a certain time. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they ran out of parchment. I don't know. <laughs> that too, yes. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. If, I, if I've said anything of ignorance, uh, I ask forgiveness. I, 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 it's funny. I, I know friends who have talked to me about Mayan civilization. I have one friend who traces her lineage through that, and I know it was a very rich culture and a very rich government, uh, a very interesting society, and uh, and you're right, it was very advanced in many ways. Mm -hmm. Very advanced indeed, too. You also advanced as well, too. I out of a dream. I had a dream, uh, and I wrote Field Day, uh, a short script. I wasn't even sure if I was going to shoot it, and then I met Someone from the UK, a distributor, who said, you know, if you if you shoot this in HD, because HD was very young then, this was 2004, said if you shoot this in, in HD, my, my distribution company will distribute it through Screen International Magazine. So I made the movie Field Day, which was really about if we don't learn from the past, we're really going to repeat the mistakes well into the future. Those mistakes being maybe being too precipitous about war. So it was about a group of young people who go into this field that's rumored to be haunted by Vietnam veterans, and they land themselves square into Vietnam. And what ensues is a lot of the th kind of things that went on. We actually had uh, someone who had been through Special Forces three times, not once or twice, but three times. Oh, my in goodness. He had been through Special Forces three times. <laughs> as a very young person, and he was also kind of giving us, getting us into the mood and, and giving us some history, and we wanted to make it very authentic, as well as send the message that, yeah, uh, war is not something you want to go in uh, without thought. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. The kinds of things that happen in war and the way we tear ourselves apart, even the way that was happening in Vietnam. He explained, for example, I'd never heard of fragging before. He explained to me what fragging was where let's say you had a captain who you felt was taking you into danger, you might just put a grenade under his cot one day and boom, he's gone. That stuff was apparently going on. And I asked him, what was the most authentic movie about Vietnam? He said Platoon. Platoon by far was definitely the most authentic, which is kind of scary when you think about it because Platoon was a very brutal movie. It was, yes. It was. It was a very brutal movie which put into question 
was it right to do this? Should we have done this? And what, what were the consequences? What prices did we pay for it? Um, so I'm very proud of, of Field Day. And it's actually part of um, a couple of universities have it in their archives. Um, they use it for educational purposes. Because even though it was not made as a documentary but a drama, it obviously touches on some of those subjects um, sufficiently uh, authentically that they felt the, the, you know, the desire to include it in their curriculum. So I'm very proud of that. It, it does sound amazing, too. And who is the guy that said that um, for those who don't, don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it? Who, uh, who said that quote? I forget. That's an excellent question because it, off the top of my head, I can't remember. It's a very famous quote, and I don't know if we can attribute it. If we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat it. That's an excellent question. If anybody out there knows... Uh, put it in our social media when this posts, uh, because I would like to know too. De- because that is the tagline for Field Day. It's um, it's it's um, the sometimes the lessons of the pa- sometimes sometimes the events of the past are the lessons of the future. Mm-hmm. And that's very true, also. And I remember something similar. You know, watching Platoon and um, watching all the stuff that goes on also makes me think of Black Hawk Down, which was actually um, based on the events in uh, Kosovo. And I guess the question is, with all these Black Hawks being shot down and um, all the people in, uh, you know, Kosovo just going after, um, you know, the the U.S. military. I guess the question you're right is like, you know, what what are we doing here and why? Why why is this happening? Why war is war necessary, or has it become part of our economic infrastructure such that it becomes a an economic necessity but not a human one? Those are really big questions we have to ask. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, because I'm, I know that, for example, some have used uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a bigger part of the Mahabharata, as as just war, and some have used it as a warning against war. So it really depends on how you look at it. Mm-hmm. And I think intention, motive, reason, that has a lot to do with it. But yeah, what are we doing there becomes the question. Uh, and that was definitely a big question a lot of people asked during the Vietnam War. Right. Why? It- Right, exactly. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, talking about why and everything, uh, we move on to um, your, your uh, one of your uh, second best ones before Night Rain, the Scare Piss. And, um, you know, got a lot of amazing credit on that one. And uh, tell us all about that. Thank you for asking about that one. So that is based on a true story of therapist abuse that took place in Los Angeles. And you're Ooh. probably getting the thread through all of this. But I really like history. And I really like actual events, and I like weaving those things into a narrative structure as opposed to a documentary. I love documentaries. I watch a lot of documentaries. A lot of my colleagues and friends make documentaries. I've worked on a couple, uh, but I love I love the narrative cinema experience, but I do love to weave those things in. In The Scarapist, you have a true story of therapist abuse uh, that actually did take place in Los Angeles in the mid-2000s. And so The Scarapist is a thriller based on that uh, about a woman who's basically uh, pulled into uh, a very uh, duplicitous, uh, manipulative, and ultimately terrifying uh, situation by a a, a kind of a new age type therapist who uh, really wants to espouse spirituality without God or religion. Mm -hmm. And what ensues from that is rather demonic, actually. (laughs) So it's not a pretty picture. Um, And a lot of it was based on uh, real life, uh, the real life uh, notes that the scarapist took, a lot of uh, real life hypnosis techniques, which inspired movies like Get Out. Um, The scarapist came first. Um, And uh, so now you have, and it was also a multi genre film. It was like a a thriller slash black comedy slash drama slash horror. Um, which at the time a lot of people frowned on. They said, well, you know, festivals don't like it. Distributors don't like multi-genre films. They don't like two female leads. Now you see that everywhere. The Scarapist did that. The Scarapist set the stage and left room for those movies to come forward. So I'm really proud of that, too. And, and, and it makes sounds of the lambs look like uh, Sesame Street. That's what it sounds like. So <laughs> I actually, I, you know, I love Silence of the Lambs. Uh, I really do love that film. Um, and I, I think that Jodie Foster uh, did a phenomenal job, and Jonathan Demme. Wow, well, you can't, you know, not say Anthony Hopkins in that breath too. It was a great, great job on the part of Jonathan Demme. Um, love the film, but it's funny that you say that because on the one hand, you have a movie 
like Silence of the Lambs that deals straight up with things like psychology and pathology. And what you have with the Scarapist is something that deals with psychology, pathology, and and religion and spirituality. Wow. All those, all those above. Amazing. And where can we find the Scarapist, Field Day, and Breath of God and more at? Excellent question. So Breath of God, of course, is at the Brooklyn Museum. They used to have it virtually available. I haven't seen it available virtually. They might go back to that in the wake of, of what's happening with uh, the unfortunate uh, COVID situation. Um, but uh, uh, there's a uh, field day is available on DVD uh, through Amazon.com. And the Scarapist is on an AVOD platform, fairly new, called Curdled TV. Curdled so TV. It's actually available for free. Yeah, it's actually available for free on Curdled TV. Curdled TV. Okay, I'll uh, write that in my notes and um, download that and uh, watch that. And we're going to talk about Night Rain in just a minute. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley, and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written. It's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm going to highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing. Available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. It's Mike from The Mike Widener Show. The Mike Widener Show can be heard on over 30 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple, and more. Coming soon to Podbean, Buzzsprout, Pandora, and TuneIn, where The Mike Widener Show interviews great guests, cool conversation, lots of laughs, coffee, and more. Take The Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device, subscribe to The Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel, and follow The Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. And if there's one thing you can count on in these unpredictable times, it's that you're in good hands getting some great radio, courtesy of The Mike Wagner Show. We're here with director Gene Maurice Bacuza here on The Mike Wagner Show. And we talked about the um, Breath of God, Field Day, The Scarapist, and um, all kinds of movies just uh, tying into um, a, a very very unique features and just a lot of great perspectives. And we go back to the 40s in film noir with Night Rain that recently premiered at the uh, 16th annual L.A. Femme International Film Fest. And uh, tell us more about Night Rain as we go back to the 40s. So Night Rain started, I started writing the screenplay right after shooting The Scarapist. I really had developed this new uh, awe and admiration of independent filmmaking. Uh, you really have to hustle and do many jobs on an independent set. And it's sort of like once you start production, you're sliding down a slide, uh, you're on a certain schedule, and you've got a certain budget, and you've got to meet that. And it, it's, it's born with certain challenges, but it also brings such a camaraderie. You feel like you've become a family through those two, three weeks, you know, sometimes four weeks, but usually it's around two to three weeks for lower budgets. And I just felt so much uh, flavor from that. I thought I really want to somehow incorporate independent filmmaking and a love letter to cinema itself with the 1940s, which I had been studying uh, through film noir uh, on my own, uh, and uh, ended up uh, obtaining a, uh, earning a uh, certificate in film noir studies. And I thought, well, okay, this is going to be part of the sort of the, the inside joke, because you have these independent filmmakers who are going to make a low-budget period movie. Anyone who knows about film filmmaking, <laughs> that is a joke. They are going to make a low-budget period movie. And I thought, how are we going to do this? What what do we bring in with the 
1940s, you know, I thought about films like Woman in the Window um, with, with uh, Edward G. Robinson, uh, uh, Joan Bennett, uh, Dan Dury, and I thought, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not just going to be about a film noir movie. It's not just going to be a movie about a movie about a movie. It's, and I remember I was on IMDb back when they had their their uh, their chat areas, their user chat areas, and someone there had posted something about a book by a woman named Mary Pasios mm -hmm. called Childhood Shadows. Now, it turned out she is the only person who personally knew Elizabeth Short who wrote a book about the Black Dahlia murder. That was, of course, Elizabeth Short's nickname that she did uh, receive in life. It was not posthumously, as some people have said by the newspapers. It was in life because she wore black and she wore flowers, dahlias in her hair, and the movie The Blue Dahlia was playing around the corner at a Long Beach cinema when she was living there. So that's how she got the nickname at a place called Lander's Drugstore. And so the Black Dahlia, so I'm reading this book, and it's filled with so much empathy and kindness and personability. I'd never read anything like that. And I thought, wow, this isn't just about the facts, it's feeling the facts. There was a point where she is interviewing one of the sisters of Elizabeth Short, Muriel. And Muriel says, Mama believes that one day Elizabeth will be exonerated. And that hit me so hard because as a survivor of violence, I thought, my God, that is so often the case that victims are blamed for the aggression perpetrated against them. That definitely happened with Elizabeth Short. The, the, further, the further the story went, the more she became a prostitute, a drifter, almost like a con artist, a dark figure, or as Mary Passu said, a dark screen upon which men project their darkest fantasies and it really wasn't fair to her it was almost like she got victimized twice and i thought that's it that's the goal i'm going to make this movie night rain and i want to exonerate this woman that doesn't mean i'll solve the crime the crime has remained unsolved for almost what 74 years mm -hmm. um it's like no it's uh it's it's how do we humanize her how do we give her the dignity she deserves Ah, by making it as authentic as possible. I watched a BBC documentary, James Elroy's Feast of Death. And by the way, when I met James Elroy, the very first thing out of his mouth was, you look like Elizabeth Short. Really? <laughs> yeah, that was the very first thing out of his mouth, the very first time we met. And, um, and uh, it was Larry, Larry Harnish from the LA Times, the writer-editor from the LA Times, um, now Daily Mirror, and uh, which is which is a function of the LA Times. He, uh, the journalist, he was talking uh, with such a great deal of sensitivity and accuracy. Uh, he really did the research on her life, and I thought, ah, aha, aha. There's something about this. I wrote to him, and he started really helping me through this process, giving me some clues, if you will, to how to find my way through this like very labyrinthine. There's so much material, and so much of it is inaccurate. Trying to find the accuracies is not just finding a needle in a haystack. It's like finding uh, finding a uh, the hole of the needle in the haystack. You know, it's so deep. And so I spent about four years going through FBI files, going through newspaper reports, uh, contacting or contacting people like Glenn Creason at the LA Public Library, who is a really uh, talented and bright historian. Um, and just just digging and digging and building the screenplay and the story behind it and continuing to dig. And that's really, that's how Night Rain came to be. Um, and once we had the script, and I worked with my editor so that we'd have some idea of how post-production needed to also take place, we were ready to start casting. And to cast the roles, I said to myself, well, the best way to cast this movie is to find people not who fit, the slot of the character but rather see the character in the person first mm -hmm. and that's really that's really how it happened and it all came together we started shooting in december of 2016 and we finished literally just after midnight on january 15 2017 exactly 70 years to the day 
and probably almost to the minute from what we know of when Elizabeth Short took her last breath. And we didn't even plan it that way. We didn't even plan it that way. That's how it just happened. Wow, that is something. And um, and where can we find uh, Night Rain at? Well, Night Rain was recently, we recently <laughs> inked a deal with a, a First Focus International, uh, their sales representatives, and they're actually going public uh, this week, taking it to potential buyers. So Night Rain did play, as you mentioned, at La Femme International Film Festival. Uh, it is being shopped and hopefully will become available uh, sometime very early next year. And we're so... And we're very looking forward to it. Once again, director Jean Marie Spacuza of Night Rain, Scarapist, Field Day, and Breath of God here on the Mike Wagner Show. A very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. And just a few more things here. We'd love to have you back on 2021 and beyond and give us some updates. And uh, who do you consider, um, or actually, let's start with this here, is that uh, what do you have, uh, what can we expect from you in 2021 and beyond, Jean? Oh, that's a great question, Mike. Really good. I will be, I am actually... I've entered pre-production of my next feature titled Making Angels, which is uh, a story of a group of artists whose lives collide in the famed Algonquin Hotel in New York City, and they're haunted by the guiding spirit of satirist writer Dorothy Parker. Wow, I'm so looking forward to it, and uh, keep us up to date. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Oh, probably, I would say, Lena Wertmuller, Alfred Hitchcock, and David Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> Twin Peaks, that's a classic every time I think of David Lynch, yes. <laughs> Indeed. In fact, his sound editor, John Neff, who he was referred to as the man or the right-hand man to David for so many great movies, like Mulholland Drive, uh, Straight Story, he was our sound editor and designer for Night Rain. Wow, that is something, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Oh, the best advice is uh, keep keep loving, keep laughing. Uh, Remember to be kind. Uh, Always be creative. Um, and don't let anybody get you down. <laughs> mm-hmm. And most importantly, keep making great movies. That's my advice, oh, too. <laughs> well said, Mike. I love it. Well said, indeed. Yes, that's right. And once again, uh, director of Night Rain, Scare Piss, Field Day, Breath of God and More, Gene Maurice Bacuza here on the Mike Wagner Show. Gene, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. And uh, once again, just tell, about your, tell us about your upcoming projects, what's your website, how do people contact you where can people uh check out your movies well we just started we've just been developing uh, a new website from the ground up called uh seasons and amuse studios yes seasons and amuse incorporated and seasons and amuse productions is now uh, an entertainment conglomerate woman owned woman run and so seasons and amuse studios.com is one way to find us we're all over social media facebook instagram twitter uh, and uh, you can just, uh, you know, send us a message, and we will respond. Sounds very good. Once again, Gina, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely great. Looking forward to having you again soon. Do us a favor. Keep us up to date. Love you back on in 2021 and beyond, and don't forget to keep in touch, and like I said, keep great, making great movies and more. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all. Thank you. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Sonic Web Studios specializes in custom web design, app development, social networking, search engine optimization, domain registration, email marketing, online stores, and more. Since our birth, we have been designing and developing immaculate websites and providing web solutions which are a cut above the rest. As a leading web designing enterprise, we have a team of extremely talented web designers who are well-focused and have the experience of working on multiple web developing platforms such as PHP, Magento, Custom WordPress, and more. Sonic Web Studios has been helping businesses of all kinds, whether big, small, established, or startup, impress their audiences with exemplary web solutions. We don't just create beautiful and functional websites. We give you a complete online solution with the main goal of enhancing your yearly revenues. We aim to give your business the online exposure and brand acknowledgement that will help you in achieving increased conversions leading to profitable sales. Call 1-800-303-3960.
or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley, and I'm an American actress and a TV host, and I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real-life relationship. It's just, it's well-written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm going to highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamoshenzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and themikewagnershow.com. Please support our program with your donations at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again next time for another great episode of The Mike Wagner Show. 